नमस्कार दिस इज माचर गणपति डेप्यूटी रजिस्ट्रार ऑफ गंगाधर मेर यूनिवर्सिटी आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू द नेशनल वेबिनार इज अ पार्ट ऑफ द वेबिनार सीरीज ऑन कॉन्फिगरिंग वर्नकुलर रीजन्स एंड बिलोंग बिगिनेस हिस्टोरिकल पर्सपेक्टिव्स बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय द स्कूल ऑफ हिस्ट्री ऑफ गंगाधर मेर यूनिवर्सिटी अमृता बिहार संबलपुर वी हैव विद अस आवर ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर प्रोफेसर एन नागराजू सर हु इज द ड्राइविंग फोर्स बिहाइंड all our academic engagements and uh, we are fortunate to have got uh, the famous historian distinguished historian and social scientist uh, professor vairavi prasad sahu sir so namaskar and welcome to uh, gangadhar mer university sambalpur and we are thankful to uh, professor sahu sir for honoring the invitation of our esteemed vice chancellor and sparing his very valuable time uh, for the benefit of our student teachers and research scholars thank you sir thank you for joining with us i take this opportunity to welcome all the members of the syndicate academic council all the distinguished guests uh, those faculties and students from different universities and colleges who have joined this program i also welcome all our faculties head of department chairman pg council a registrar all all officers of the university all students and research scholars of all departments especially uh, department of history and social sciences and everyone those who have joined this program and i also thank uh, the organizing team uh, led by uh, dr umakan mishra uh, the head of the school of history and all the all the members of faculty members of the school of history uh, thank you very much for joining with us uh, uh, let me tell you before the beginning of the program that this is uh, not 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 something uh, something out of academic this is purely an academic exercise and as sir has said uh, professor sau sir that region is not an axiomatic category but historically formed an evolving entity so this is about the for the process of formation of regions and the historical perspective associated with evolution of regions so therefore i request all of you to take this and accept this as a purely academic exercise and we are fortunate and up to have got uh, mm -hmm. professor hari prasad sahu sir and our students and research scholar teachers will be greatly benefited by this so thank you very much i welcome you again and now i request our honorable vice chancellor professor n nagaraju sir for the opening remarks thank you dr pati uh, registrar pg council chairman professors and all the colleagues in the department i join you in welcoming professor distinguished scholars particularly on I welcome you, Professor Sahu. I am very kind of you to have invited us and joined us. And the second factor is, I think, that Kamisra has arranged a series of lectures. It's a very good initiative, and uh, let's see this. Uh, let's go through these uh, series and see what benefit it academically. to us as well as our students but lecture is and i think the vernacular region uh, the note say it is the vernacular region as seldon pollock has you know told it is this second millennium phenomenon and constituted by exposed historical process and the studies of such regions has led to various overviews i think professor sahu is more aware of those things what is more important is these regions have multiple sources of cultural inheritance which is what we should be aware of because the multiplicity of sources and the poly polyvalence of you know polyvalence of the and standing a particular process is what makes intelligence all the more relevant and all the more expanding i look forward to this lecture and uh, i'm sure professor sahu will throw light on it in a detailed manner and we all get that i welcome dr sahu again and thank you all thank you very much thank you sir thank you for being the brain behind this program and i take this opportunity to organizing this program <clears throat> and we are also thankful to our chairman pg council professor mohin mohammad sir 
रजिस्टर श्रीमती जुगलेश्वरी दास ऑल द ऑल द टीचर्स एंड फैकल्टी मेंबर्स नॉन टीचिंग स्टाफ एंड द सपोर्ट टीम फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस प्रोग्राम एंड बीइंग अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट द कन्वेनर एंड हेड ऑफ द स्कूल ऑफ हिस्ट्री डॉक्टर उमाकांत मिश्रा टू इंट्रोड्यूस द थीम एंड आल्सो स्पीक अबाउट आवर चीफ गेस्ट एंड स्पीकर प्रोफेसर साहू सर डॉक्टर मिश्रा थैंक यू सो मच एंड डॉक्टर पति esteemed vice chancellor esteemed speaker and distinguished distinguished participants which include our respected honorable secretary i give me immense pleasure to welcome professor bharat prasad sahu to this webinar and how does one con configure the configure india region sub regions and localities are they need divisions organically related to each other or are there sharedness as well as specificities and pluralities let me enter into the uh, theme note uh, by quoting from kapila samhita 13th century takes on various khetras of odisha batsanam bharat shreshto deshanam utkala srutah utkalasya samodeshu desha nasti mahitale which translated say that no among all the barsas because the idea of barsa is a cosmological puranic idea out of nine barsa there is one barsa called bharat barsa and among bharat varsha it says that there is no desh like utkala does this need division of india and utkala merely a part of cosmological descriptions of conventional cosmopolitan language of sanskrit diana x says that through repetitions of places circuits and through this sacred language of sanskrit a sacred geography of india was created in ancient and medieval time seldon pollock on the other hand explores the emergence of a vernacular region in second millennium ad vernacularization refers to process of emergence of distinct historical regions which are expressed in literary languages of the region such regions emerged in the convergence of many forces and are quite dynamic therefore nation regions sub regions are not immanent axiomatic entities they were constituted in history and had undergone mutations and changes there is sharedness across sub regions and localities but this sadness developed over time and differentially over space in case of odisha the sadness which developed in different time and in different spaces in different majors include process of presentization of tribe integrate integration of autochthona calls and emergence of jagannath as rashtra devata as well as agami kalingi kalinga architecture there are other elements as well but there are also specific specificities of localities and sub regions region is not a homogeneous space therefore the use of constructs like nation region as naturalistic homogeneous space spaces is deeply problematic thinking through the historical contemporary processes the webinar seeks to understand relations of nation region sub regions and localities in their dynamic interfaces and ruptures in their allegiance as well as shared identities on the one hand and their specificities and pluralities on the other it is important at the same time to highlight that present administrative boundary of the region is not coterminous with historical cultural region let us take the example of bengal where there is a, now a talk of third partition of bengal by creating a separate state consisting of northern bengal region 
the 1905 partitions on emotional sort of Bengali brotherhood cutting across religion. The Bengali cultural grouping and identity have uh, gave way to communal identity in 1906, uh, which led to partition in 1947. However, the communal allegiance gave way to emergence of Bangla nation state in 1972, but without the unification of larger cultural regions. But that is, this cultural region is not a homogeneous space either. There is Jungle Mahal, there are Radha, there are Samatat, uh, Harikela and others, which were distinct sub-regions within the cultural region of Bengal. Now there is a talk of creating sub-region within Bengal based on religious democracy. This reflects the changing nature of identity, polity, belongingness, and issues of power and domination. So, how, Professor Bhairavi Shahu is an expert in this field. He is a distinguished historian and social scientist of India who has brought about a paradigm paradigmatic change in the study of Indian history. From early study of regional history, like history of Odisha, history of Bengal, who is treated region as a naturalistic entity, Professor Sahu is one of the historians who studied the process of region formations. For him, region is not an axiomatic category, but historically formed and more importantly evolving. He is quite quick to add in his writings that categories like Nation, regions, locals are not homogeneous spaces. And this is what I have learned from him. Professor Sahu has been teaching in the University of Delhi for last three decades. He has served as the president of ancient Indian history sections of Indian History Congress. Professor Sahu is fundamentally one of the few historians who are responsible in bringing about this change in our approach to the study of region. He was part of German research project between 2019-9 and 2005. He has delivered lecture in numerous universities of the world, including University of Kiel, University of Heidelberg, and others. He is the author and editor of a dozen of books published from OEP, Primus, Monor, and few more are coming from Cambridge and Rockledge. The two most fundamental books that brought about this change in our gaze towards study of region is the making of regions in Indian history, society, state, identity in pre-modern Odisha, recently published in 2020 by Primus, and then history of pre-colonial India issues and debates, Oxford University Press 2018, changing gaze in 2015, history and theory study of state institution and the making of history orient black sons, uh, there are numerous other books, and today he will be speaking on the sub region of Odisha, which is the of Dakshinakosa. I welcome Professor Sahu to this webinar series. I am extremely thankful to him and to many other speakers who will be part of this webinar series, including fundamental thinkers like Professor Prabhu Mahapatra, Nivedita Mahanti, Professor Chandi Prasadananda, and Manu Devadevanya. I welcome all of you to this webinar series and request Professor Sahu to deliver his talk. Thank you so much. So I can get along? Sir. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, I would like to start by thanking Mr. Vice Chancellor for this kind invitation, allowing me to share some of my ideas with all of you. I would also like to thank Dr. Umakanta and his department for extending this invitation along with Mr. Vice Chancellor. And as all of you know, the title of today's presentation is The Shaping of the Kina uh, Now what I intend doing is that engage in some preliminaries for 10 minutes because these preliminaries will be important to tying up the argument as it proceeds thereafter. And uh, so, th so that would be basically the structure of the presentation. Uh, now the point is, when you talk about the shaping of South Koshara, the question that would arise is that, why do we study regions? What is the historian's regions? How is it different from 
normally what we accept as the category of region and so on. Now, why I'm asking the point is, when you talk about this whole question of region, and then why the, what are the categories of the historians region and so on, as students of history, I would like to remind everybody that there's a distinction between writing regional histories and doing histories of the regions. Now, if you were to demarcate the difference, the point is almost till the mid seventies, people wrote about basically regional histories. What does regional history represent? Regional history basically represented a situation where the linguistic formations of post-independence India were deemed to be historicized. That you had a Orissa, you had an Andhra, you had a Bengal, and whatever boundaries we got, we thought that these are boundaries which are historically inherited across time. Forgetting the fact that these were all political creations. Somebody sitting in Delhi drew up the lines and maps and that's how a Bengal and a Orissa were created. These are not historical regions. And what people did in course of the 50s and 60s and even early 70s is that to historicize these categories. And when I say historicize these categories, what I'm basically arguing is that people tried to take the antiquity of structures and institutions back in time, graft poetic characters, draft artistic heroes, draft great rulers onto their territories. Or in other words, it is a question of privileging one region over the other. Bengal will privilege itself over Orissa, Orissa will privilege itself over Andhra, and so on. And so this business of privileging of one region over the other, this is what regional history was all about. Now the question is, how is history of the regions different from writing regional histories? When you do history of the regions, what one is interested in is not privileging one region over the other, but basically trying to create and see how structures and institutions evolved. How did a larger political entity come into being? How did agrarian expansion happen? How did social changes transform and a regional caste society was created? Why and how did temples emerge in a certain style in a certain area? Now, these are issues and how are they interrelated with one another? So the element of chauvinism, the element of subnationalism is underplayed in these things, whereas it is the structure of institutions, how they gel, how they evolve, how they transform over time. And these are issues that basically one does when one does history of the regions and so on. Now the question is, when did all this begin? And you know, are there examples of uh, writings which one can look into and so on? Now all I would say, without meaning any malice, is that look into H.K. Mahatab's 1949 address to the Indian History Congress in the local section. If you look into the proceedings of the Indian History Congress, H.K. Mahatab, 1949, you'll find when he's talking about the region of Orissa, is for him, Orissa represents the coastal districts. There's nothing beyond the coastal districts that's a part of Orissa. And that he taught was Orissa all through and so on and so forth. And so that's a good example of writing the regional history, not history of the region. Whereas from the mid seventies and after the new pattern that I'm suggesting that comes into play. But this idea that came in, this idea was in some senses also reinforced by the whole idea of Indian feudalism, which came up in mid sixties and after. And once the idea of Indian feudalism was put across, then everybody started looking for feudalism in the different regions. People looked for feudalism in Kerala, feudalism in Assam, feudalism in Orissa, and so on. So once you do that, what happens is the present the boundaries of the modern administrative divisions of Orissa or Bengal or Assam. Now that is what you take up for your study and then that's how you do it. And when you do it, that's what I was saying earlier. You try to historicize the present day administrative boundaries, post independent boundaries, linguistic boundaries, and push them back in time into pre-modern, pre-colonial times that you try to take them on and so on. And this is something that the historian will have to be more careful about and look into. So then the question would ask that would ask would be asked is. What is the historian's category of region? 
The historians category of region is historical evolved entities. Now, when I say historically evolved entities, there are entities which evolve historically and culturally through time. And when I say that, if you look into the inscriptional record, if you look into the literary record, that's where you find them. For example, if you look into a Vishnu Purana, for example, if you look into Kalidasa Dragovamsa, if you look into early medieval inscriptions, there you would find categories or entities such as Kamarupa, Banga, Utkala, Kalinga, Dakhina Koshara, Malava, Vengi, and so on. These are historical regions which have come up. Now, subsequently, these historical regions, when you look into modern times, they have not been allowed to be integrated as a part of a cultural region, as a part of a historical region. In some cases, yes, but in some cases, these historical regions have been divided between states. Good examples of that are Kalinga, near a home. Part of Kalinga is in Orissa, part of Kalinga is in Andhra Pradesh. A good example of that is Dakshina Koshal. Part of that is in Western Orissa, part of that is in Chhattisgarh. And therefore, these historical categories were not given the due, and somebody sitting somewhere drew up the lines and divided these, what call, created this modern state in the six six. This is something that a student of history should know. Then the question is, why should we study the regions? When you ask the questions, why should we study the region? Why not study India? The point is, India, people realized by the 70s was a difficult proposition to study for two reasons. One, studies which claim to be talking about the study of India were essentially studies of Gangetic Northern India. People studied Gangetic Northern India and then went on to generalize that this is Indian history. And the problem one can easily imagine. What happens in Uttar Pradesh or Haryana or um, Bihar did not be true of Madhya Pradesh or Orissa or Maharashtra. And therefore, there were problems with talking about Indian history. And this is and it's perfectly understandable. One person will not know half a dozen languages to make a proper study of the sources and create Indian history. Similarly, by the 70s, we all know that sociologists or social anthropologists, that they were working on different aspects of caste, power, um, caste relations, the um, nature of villages and so on. They were all studying a village. Now this a village that people study, increasingly historians believe, social scientists believe that this was not perhaps capturing the complexity of the Indian reality. And therefore, studying India was problematic, studying a village as sociologists did was not satisfactory. And therefore, the region came up as a category which perhaps was bereft of either of these kinds of problems. And therefore, the study of the region becomes important. That is how from mid 70s, you find people gradually studying a Rajasthan, a Orissa, a Bengal, and so on and so forth. And this is what basically goes on to happen. Now, when you study regions, there are two, three issues that as students of history, we should remember. Now, what are these two, three issues? One, regions are not bounded. They are not isolated islands. Regions exist in a situation of interaction and change with what you call the national or the trans-regional. Now, when I say national or trans-regional, for example, Orissa, if you were to understand, Orissa can be understood with reference to Bengal, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra, North India, and so on. Because there are overlapping cultural influences all the time in operation. Besides that, however, that's not the end of it. Now, when there are cultural influences between the trans-regional and the regional, then they are actually impacting each other. They're shaping each other. Now, while they are doing that, similarly, no region is a homogeneous entity. No region is an undifferentiated entity. The regions within comprise what you call the sub-regions and localities. Now, for example, in the context of Orissa, 
when you're talking about the sub-regions, you can talk about the Utkal, you can talk about the Kalinga, you can talk about the Kirakosha, and many more. Now, these are referred to in the inscriptions, if you see, as Mandala states, or these are Mandalas. And so the sub-regions are, that's what you basically see. Now, the, the story doesn't end there. The sub-regions would also comprise what you call localities. Now, when you say localities, now somebody might ask, what do you mean by locality? You see, locality is an expression which basically derives itself from the term called Janapada. A Janapada is a term which comes from the later Vedic period and after. Now, what Janapada means is a group of settlements comprising a locality. That is, if you look at the term more closely, it will mean footsteps of people. Jana plus Pada makes Jana Pada, footsteps of people. And therefore, what you're talking about, a group of settlements, a varied dimension, a varied character, which basically constitute a locality, they're cultivating for themselves, they're managing their day-to-day -day affairs, and we should be looking after themselves, and so this is what a Jana Pada is. For example, Puru, Panchala, Surasena, these later Vedic entities, they started off as Jana Padas, and subsequently we go on to become Mahajana Padas. So that is what a Jana Pada is. Now, Janapada is a North Indian term in Sanskrit. But similarly, in South India, if you go, you have an expression called Nadu. The Nadu is equivalent to a Janapada. The Nadu is not only typical of Tamil Nadu. Nadu was there in Andhra, in Kerala, in Karnataka as well. Now, so that is what is a basically Janapada. Now, with Janapada, over time, they come together. They create what is known as a Mandala or a Desha. And Mandala and Desha are territorial entities which start coming up in the early medieval times, roughly between 6th, 7th centuries to 14th, 15th centuries that these Mandalas or Desha they start shaping up and coming. Now, this is one part of the story. The other part of the story is that as students of history, we should know there's a concept called secondary state formation or successor states. Now, what is the secondary state formation of successor states? Now, what it basically means is that once the Mauryas or the Satavahanas, when they created that larger entities, it's from there it derives itself. That when the Mauryas expanded, for example, the Mauryas expanded horizontally. They did not penetrate vertically evenly all over. When they expanded horizontally, they covered large parts of the subcontinent, but their physical presence was uneven depending on what resources the state could get to which particular place. And so naturally, when their physical presence was uneven across spaces, naturally the level of interactions of the Mauryan state with other areas varied from place to place. And therefore, what the Mauryas did is interacted with various kinds of chieftains, various kinds of local ruling chiefs, and then got whatever they wished to. And so after the collapse of the modern empire, these local chiefs, having gained administrative experience, then go on to have a better profile. And so that is how secondary state formation started. Now, the similar things happened in the Deccan and the Satavahanas. The, 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 the Satavahanas created a state from coast to coast, but again, it was unevenly present. Therefore, local chiefs of plenty come up in Andhra Pradesh, they come up in Central India, they come up in Karnataka. So that is what it is. And therefore, because we're talking about this whole business of locality formation and secondary state formation, but these are things that have to be kept in mind and conceptually when you're looking into different regions and so on and so forth. Now that takes me on to the story of the Kosher and how it shapes up. Now, when you look into Dakshina Kosha, as most of you would know, Dakshina Kosha is basically defined by Mekara, Vidharva, Basta, Kalinga, Andhra. So, so, so that's what basically defines see. Now, in territorial terms, it would basically comprise Durg, Bilaspur, Raigad, Raipur in Chhat modern Chhattisgarh, and the Balangir, Kalahandi, Sambalpur tract. That you have in the stories uh, that would constitute the Kirakoshala. Now, if you look into this area of the Kirakoshala uh, and see that when did this term Koshala come into play, 
then you realize that in the second century AD, we have the earliest reference in a particular scene, which calls itself, which has the expression, Gama Shakoshalia. The Gama Shakoshalia would basically suggest that the village, which is known by the name Koshala, and that's how it would emerge. But this term Koshala then continues in the Alabad inscription of Samudragupta. Because Samudragupta is talking about his southern conquest. Now, uh, King Mahendra of Koshara is basically mentioned. Then, if you look at the Vakataka inscriptions, look at the inscriptions of Pulakesh and Second, you would find Koshara being repeated. That along with conquests of Mekala and Kalinga and Andhra, Koshara is also being mentioned. Similarly, if you look into your Ruen San's accounts, you have a description of the territory, the land, the people, the habits, customs, they all come alive. And so, what you find is that continuously if from around the second century to you know, what you call seventh century and after you have this expression Koshara coming up. Now, whether it is the name of the territory which was Koshara, which was being communicated repeatedly, or it is people who wanted to, what you call, call this area Koshara because already you had a Koshara in the north, so this becomes Dakhina Koshara and Dakhina Koshara finds actual expression under the Kalachuri is much more clearly later on. And so, uh, but there's a two way process of communication. The people giving it the name Koshara, the name was already there. Uh, it, uh, so it's a two way traffic, and that's how the area comes to be known as Koshara. And that's something that got to be thought about. Now, when you go on historically to go on to, you know, what you call flesh out, what is the evidence that you're having for this area? Then, frankly speaking, historically speaking, the earliest reference to the area, not just Koshara, but to the area, comes from the Mauryan Major Rock Edict, Oshokan Major Rock Edict 13. If you look into the Oshokan Rock Edict Major 13, Major Rock Edict 13, what you'll find is that Oshoka is talking about the Atavikas who are troublesome people in that area. And Oshoka threatens these Atavikas that unless they behave themselves, the state will be forced to take action against them. And so this is something which is happening in the middle of the third century BC. And then what you call the same area and the same people, Atavikas, are being referred to in some of the Gupta's inscription, as I just mentioned, the Alabad Prasasti, in the middle of the fourth century AD. And what is some of the Gupta saying? He, the context of reference to this people has changed. Because in some of the Gupta's inscriptions in this area, the Atavikas now are being referred to as Atavikarajya. And so people who are troublesome people earlier now go on to constitute Rajyas, and so they are having Atavikarajya. Now, what is the interest for a historian? The interest for a historian is that in the course of the 600 years, this area has undergone transformation. What is that transformation? The transformation is number one, that there has been change of landscape. Now, what is change of landscape? That is Forest areas or wilderness has been brought under agriculture and it partly transformed into khetras. Because unless you have a khetra, unless you have a janapada, you can't have a state system or a chieftaincy or an early state. Similarly, there's also change in the domain of community life. Now, community life in the sense that some kind of hierarchization of society is happening, some kind of social differentiation is happening. A ruling elite is emerging, and that's how these chieftaincies are coming up in that area. Similarly, there's also a transformation of ideology. And so that you have an ideology which is hold the differentiated society, this early state or chieftaincies will be held together because of some ruling ideology that's coming up, some strategies of domination that are basically coming up. So these are the transformations that you would find by the time of some of the that have happened. Now the question that as historians we will ask is that what is that happened? What is the data or evidence that we have which goes on to tell us that these kinds of transformations happen or were happening? Now, frankly speaking, we do not have literary data. We do not have much of inscriptional data for this period. What we have between the Mauryas and Guptas or between the two empires is archeological data coming up from several sites in what you call as the Kirin 
Now, what is the archaeological data that you basically have? Now, the archaeology of sites that we talk about, what you are basically talking about is essentially sites such as Malhar in Bilaspur, Terighat in Dud. And as you move forward, you have sites such as Asurgarh or Narla Asurgarh in Kalahandi. You have Budigarh. You have sites like Monomunda. You have sites such as Taraporgarh. You have sites such as Gurubheda and Khardiagarh in Golangi. And one can go on. And frankly speaking, uh, yeah, I think some of you might know that uh, um, Dr. Makanta uh, is very good at these uh, what you call early historical data. And in fact, I think within a year or so, this book would come out on the archaeology of the early historical period um, for you know, what you call um, what is uh, and it should also include uh, this Western part of Odisha as well. Now, what is that that these different sites that I mentioned want to demonstrate? Now, they demonstrate that roughly between 350 to 350 BC to 300 AD, you have entire range of what you call changes happening. The sites have reported a lot of iron tools, including agricultural tools, artisanal tools, tools. They've reported what you call semi precious beads. They reported um, semi precious stone beads. They reported glass beads. Um, they have reported what you call um, objects um, uh, such as uh, pottery. And pottery would include your northern black polished ware to knobbed ware. In between, you would have other kinds of pottery like black and red ware, which is an early historic pottery and you know, pottery influenced by Satavana designs. Kushanas and so on. You also have a large number of coins from Pashmak to Kushana to Satavahana to uninscribed coins in between. And so that's the collection that you basically have. Now, what's interesting is that this pottery that we are talking about was starting from Malahar and Tirigat in Chhattisgarh down to these places like Asurgarh, Manmunda, and others. There's a commonality of goods and artifacts. And when you say commonality of goods and artifacts, what one is basically saying is that similar kinds of objects, uh, whether it's NBP, whether it's an obdwear, whether it's semi precious stone, beads, ornaments, now there's a commonality of these objects that you basically find. And when you find a commonality of these objects, then the question arises, why and how was it so? Now here, this, um, what you call, general, general assumption is that the rivers played what you call some kind of what you call uh, the role in communicating objects and, and sort of creating the sense of commonality. Communicating these objects in the sense that the Mahanadi, the Tail, the Om, Rau, and such rivers that are, or even the Sionat, that these rivers are the ones which are used for um, uh, connecting one side with the other and so on. And what I'm saying, I'm not imagining things. There's a gentleman called Deloche, D-E-L-O-C-H-E. Deloche has written lovely, two lovely works on communication, one on land transport, one on river and uh, sea transport. And so if you look at Deloche's works, uh, the point comes out quite well, that even in Orissa and Chhattisgarh, how the rivers are enabling these transactions. And, um, which, um, and that, that's what explains this. The common presence of goods and commodities and so on. So when you talk about these sites that I just mentioned, now these sites are visible sites. These sites are more tangible sites because they appear to be fortified sites in most cases. They appear to be sites which appear to be some kind of urban center, small or big. But once you have these settlements, naturally the urban centers did not stand alone. The urban centers needed much more settlement to support them. And these much more settlements could be grammars, could be hamlets, could be police, and so on. And so the number of settlements are growing uh, as you look at the early historical period. And the number of settlements are growing, by implication, the historian would know that population is also increasing. The number of people are getting more and more. And so that is the picture that basically is happening in the early historical period. Now, what do these lead to? Do they give us a certain pattern? Now, a certain pattern seems to be emerging. 
And the pattern is, what I was telling you earlier, is the emergence of localities. And the localities have a center. Each locality has a central point. I'll give you the example of Malhar, for example. Now, Malhar is a site which was excavated long back in Bilaspur. And if you look at Malhar, several things converge in the site of Malhar. Now, what is that you'll find? You have evidence of fortification. You have these artifacts that I was mentioning from iron to glass to beads to other kinds of things. Now, these are, these are all there at Malhar. Now, Malhar is a point where all kinds of coins also congregate from your punch mark to Satavahana, Kushana, and so on and so forth. The large, huge tanks to support agricultural activities. That is the site through which a communication route coming from Kosambi or Allahabad area to the southeastern coast in Andhra that passes through. Now, all this, when you see combined, they create Malhar as a major node, a major nodal point. And so that nodal point is catering to that area in an enormous blast. And therefore, you find the formation of a locality and the locality center. But what is happening in Malhar is not something unique. Similar things had happened at various other places. For example, at Chandravali in Andhra Pradesh, at Vargao Madhapur in Karnataka, in the early part of the Satavan history, that you have localities evolving, and each locality had a node, a center. And so similarly, Malhar comes up as a good example, but Malhar did not stand alone. You have a place like Asulgarh, also playing that role. Maybe Manamunda or Tarapurgarh also played a similar role, that they were playing not as, as nodes or as nodal points at different places, and that these nodes were getting connected through this river system. And so that is how what you call early historical society was gradually evolving. So the point that one basically sees is that formation of localities and locality centers, this is something that was happening in the early historical period. The story does not end there. Influences when you're talking about, they came from the North, they came from Central India, they came from the Deccan into the Kanakoshwa as such. And when you're talking about influences merging and coming into the Kanakoshwa, the point is Nehena is a site many of you might know, Noapara district and uh, near Kharia. And so Nehena, the pottery evidence that you have that bears imprints of what you call um, influences from Central India and the Deccan. And under the Satavahana, that kind of influence was quite possible. When you move on to the time of the Guptas, then not only you had the some of the Guptas intrusion into that area, so his other campaigns, but also if you look at the site of Tara the, in Bilaspur area, the site of Tara in Bilaspur area had that temple complex, Jethani and Devrani. They bear distinct Gupta influences. You have these gold coins dated to the 5th, 6th centuries, which have evidence of Sankha. And so these are what you call, again, influences from the north. And so the point that I'm trying to basically make is that when Dakhina Koshala was evolving in the early historic period, it was not evolving as a bounded entity, but it was evolving through all kinds of cultural overlaps that is happening in different parts of the country. It not only influences from Orissa, influences from Vidharba and elsewhere that they basically what you call, contributed to the making of this whole what you call, area. Now this development that we're talking about, now from the sixth century upwards happened to further intensify, further expand. And the question that one would ask is that, how do we know that they intensify and expand? Now we know that largely because of the fact that the Sarapuriyas, the local first dynasty, the Pandavamsi who followed them, the Somavamsi who came after the Pandus. Now these dynasties, they start coming up in the Kanakosha. And we know about them from the inscriptions. We know about them from the temples that they patronize. We know about them from even the stone inscriptions that they left at different places. Now, what is that we gather about this, what you call um, Sarapuria, the Pandavamsi, and some of them, and so on? But you see, politically, if you look at these, what you call um, dynasties, you'll find that gradually they were evolving structurally. Now, gradually that they were evolving structurally, if you ask, how do you know that? The point is, if you see that 
Sarapuria start off as a very unobtrusive, a very uh, what you call humble dynasty. And by the time you move to the Pandavamsis, complexities start coming in. And under the Somavamsis, obviously, things are far more structured. So, what do I mean by that? I, for the, because of my absence of time, all I would say is that if you look into the taxes, if you look into the administrative units, if you look into issues of the number of officials, what you would find in every area is a gradual elaboration that is taking place. I'll give you just one or two examples on this so that you know it makes the larger point. The examples that I have in mind is that when you look at the Sarapurias, the first grant of the Sarapurias, the Pupudra plates, when you look into the Pupudra plates, what it tells us is that the king is asking or requesting the Bhogapatis to preserve the land grant. The term uses bodhayati and not samagyapati. The samagyapati would be ordered. Samagyapati comes in a little later, after 21 years of the beginning of this reign of Narendra. And so the point is you start by requesting the Bhogapatis, suggesting that the Bhogapatis are influential people, locally significant landed characters. And so you're requesting them. Now, 21 years later, when the state is, you know, gradually moving a little ahead, then you have the courage to say, or order the Bhogapatis and future Rajas to protect the grants that you are making. Similarly, in the earlier grant, you are accepting the Gupta ruler as your overlord. The expression you are using is Parama Bhattara Kapada, which then is dropped subsequently. So the point that one is trying to basically make is that these are some indicators. Not just that. If you look into the early history of the Sarapuriyas, you have half a dozen instances where the Bhogapatis are making land grants, and then the king is trying to sanctify those grants. Now, the king had not given any land grant to the Bhogapatis. The Bhogapatis had the land on their own from where they're making the donation, suggesting that Maybe the Sarapuri of themselves, like these Bhogapatis, were one of the local landed elements to rise. And then the Sarapuri are trying to integrate these Bhogapatis into a political system. And that is how the Bhogapatis are, at an early stage, powerful people, significant land owners, local notables, and so on. And the gradually, the Sarapuri state evolved. Now, from there, when you move into the time of the Pandavamsis, things get better and clearer. For example, uh, if you look into the records of the gentleman Mahasiva Gupta Balarjuna, now, Balarjuna has a whole lot of transformation. He's known as Dharmavatar. He's seen as somebody who preserves Varna and Ashram. He's seen as somebody who prevents the entry of Kali. He's somebody who is, what you call, uh, inviting Krita Yuga. Now, Krita Yuga is what we call Satya Yuga. Kali is the contrast of or the reverse of Krita Yuga. So all these Brahmanic ideas comes up in a very big way. He's seen as a patron of both Buddhism and Brahmanism. And these ideas, they further get elaborated as you go on to that of the Somavamsi. He basically declared themselves as Maharaja Dhiraj, Parama Bhattaraka, Parameshwara, in many such titles. So the point is, these are the kind of developments that are basically taking place. Now, when these developments are taking place, the other one or two issues that we got to keep in mind is that along with this, the idea of koshara is also evolving. Under the Pandavamsis, under Tivara Deva, for the first time, you find the king declaring himself to be Sakala calling Nadhipati, calling himself the lord of, sorry, Sakala Koshala Dhipati, Sakala Koshala Dhipati, the lord of the whole of koshara. And so that is what you would find now he calls them, and the Pandavamsis and later on the Somavamsis, they go on to push, call themselves Koshaladhipati, Koshalendra. The story does not end there. There's a place called Bajjanath near Bodh in central Orissa. Now there you have a deity called Koshaleshwara. Now what's interesting is you know, Koshaleshwara, Bajjanath was a part of the Koshala. And so when you have the ruler known as Koshradhipati, and if the role of calling themselves your Koshalendra and the deity on the eastern periphery 
of your koshala, known as koshaleshwa, then rulership, kingship appears to be, now you have rulership, kingship becoming ubiquitous, becoming pervasive. The kingship from your Chhattisgarh down to your Bajanath is basically pervasive and ubiquitous. That's what basically comes through. And so Koshal as an identity is gradually evolving. And that is something which will become important and so on. But when these things are happening, then one might ask why and how are these happening? What is the material foundation for these things to happen? The material foundation comes from a green expansion, rise of towns, rise of commercial centers, and so on. Now, how does one make the point? The point is that a green expansion is happening can be seen from the fact that both under the Saraputias and the Panduvamsis, you find it is essentially Raipur, Raigarh, and Kalahandi, that that is the area of activity. That is where the land grants are made. That is where agriculture is happening. When you move on to the time of the Somavamsis, then you find that it is the Bolangi, Sonpur, Bargad area which becomes the focus. Because almost, say, about more than two dozen of these Somavamsi grants are found from that particular area. And so you find that this focus of agrarian activity shifts from one area to the other. So different areas are brought under agriculture. What is interesting is that there is an expression called Chatusima that normally we find in the land grant. That is the four boundaries of the land grant. But if you look at the land grants of these people, the Sarapuriyas and the Panduvamsis, for example, and in some cases, even that of the Somavamsis in that Balangi Sonpur border area, they talk about Chatusima, but don't define it. They don't tell us what is there to the left, to the right, to the north, to the south. That allows room for agrarian growth and encroachment by the fellow who gets the grant, allowing for agrarian expansion. That's one indicator. The other indicator that you'll find is that when you look into these what do you call it, settlements that have been donated, now, what are the, the names that you get? Interestingly, the, the suffixes that you get are not grammo. Grammo is a full-fledged settlement. But these suffixes that you get in these records of the Sarapuriyas, the Panduvamsis, and even in some cases that of the Sumavamsis are not full-fledged grammars, but what you get is Padara, Padraka, Pataka, and so on. Now, what these terms signify is pallis or hamlets, which shall signify dispersed settlements and so on, or even parts of a settlement, suggesting thereby that agricultural growth is in an early stage. It's not full-fledged, it's evolving, happening. But nevertheless, it is happening. And settlements are what you call rising. And because of the rise of settlements between the Sarapuriyas to the Somavamsis, by the time of the Somavamsis, you find a rise of several towns. It in fact started happening under the, what you call, the later part of the Sarapuriyas, expanded under the Pandavamsis, and comes into its own under the Somavamsis. Why am I saying so? We know that there were places like Saravapura, Sirpur, Rajim, under the Sarapuriyas and Pandavamsis. When you, time, when you come to that Somavamsis, you will find even other places being added on. Suvarnapura or Sonpur, you have Vinizapura, you have Murasima being all added on. And so these are in some cases seen as patronas, some cases townships. Now what is a patrona? Patrona is a commercial town. And therefore, what you'll find is that not only the growth of rural settlements, some grammars, but also these developments leading to the evolution of townships. And so that is the economic foundation that's been basically laid down. This economic foundation, they create their own social categories. What is that society experiences? Now society goes on to experience the rise of different categories. So you have a category called the Kutumbin, or what is known as the middle peasant. It starts off from the sixth century and after. As you move on to the 8th century and later, you have categories like Prativasin 
and Pradhana Pratibhasi. But these are inhabitants or locally notable inhabitants. You also have the coming of categories such as Vanika, Kayastha. You also have categories like the astrologer. You have the Sutradhara. You have the Rupaka, Marakara. And these terms you know, you can easily translate them into English and so on and so forth. What is interesting is that in Dakshina Koshara, you have certain categories which were not there in Odisha or coastal Odisha. In coastal Odisha, you had several other categories, but you did not have a category like Kayastha. In coastal Odisha, you mostly had Karanas. In coastal Odisha, you had Seshtis, whereas in Dakshina Koshara, you had the Vanika. And here, you had this Pativasin and Pradhana Pativasin, Anivasin, whereas there you had Mahattaras and Mahamahattaras. So the point is the social composition, though can be comparable, but in terms of the use of terminologies, they varied between the Kira Koshara and Koshara you know, and so on. And so the point is these categories which were coming up, then gradually by the end of the first millennium and later, go on to become a part of the hierarchical caste order. If one were to ask why and how should they become a part of the hierarchical caste order, the reason is the point of reference was a dominant scheme of the Varna order. And the Varna order itself was hierarchical. And therefore, when your point of reference is hierarchical, it becomes easy to have a hierarchical caste order. Because obviously, the Suvarnakara and the Vanika would be better placed than for example, the Marakana, or for that matter, the cowherd or the Gouda. And therefore, naturally, they will be up the ladder compared to this Gouda or the Marakana. And that's how the caste order would be organized by the end of the first millennium and so on. That's also a period when Puranic Hinduism enters in a big way the area of the Kranakoshala. And when I say Puranic Hinduism enters in a big way the area of the Kranakoshala, what I'm basically arguing is that. The whole story starts from places like Tara and, and Karod. It moves on to Sirpur and Rajiv. From there, if you go further, near Nuapara, there's a place called Burikomna. And from Nuapara, if you move further, you can go up to Bajanath. You can go up to Baud. And so this is what it is. But the point that one would basically go on to ask is that what is that it represents? It represents the gradual movement of Vaishnavism and Saivism. Shiva and Vishnu and Shakti become very important. Narasimha is a popular manifestation. So is Mahisamardini. So is Durga. And so you find what you call these different what you call divinities gradually coming in. So what is that the penetration of Puranic Hinduism does? Now I call them Puranic Hinduism, not Hinduism, largely because we look into these deities, whether it's a Shiva or a Vishnu or a Shakti, or manifestations of Shakti. Now, these are all derived from the Puranas. Uh, whether you have Vishnu Purana or a Shiva Purana or a Devi Purana, now they basically, what you call, from there, that from the fourth, fifth century, that these, what you call, want to derive themselves. And secondly, Hinduism as a category, as a terminology, does not enter our vocabulary before the 14th century. And therefore, what you call, these are all referred to by historians increasingly as Puranic Hinduism. What is that Puranic Hinduism does? The Puranic Hinduism provides the ideological foundation to hold society polity together. This is what political, and so just a Puranic Hinduism. The Dakhira Koshara belt is also an area where Buddhism is very popular. And Buddhism is popular, can be seen from references to the Viharas and the Chaityas and so on at different places. For example, they are present at Malhar. They are present at Sirpu in large quantities. More recent excavation have brought out much more at Sirpu. They are also present at what you call um, 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 Sambalpur. Uh, in, in, in Sambalpur also, you have what you call these important um, um, sites at places like uh, Ganyapalli and Nagaraj, right from the fourth, fifth centuries and after. Now, while these things are happening, uh, to provide sanctity to what you call you know, the social political system, rulers started also inviting migrant Brahmanas. 
And so from around the eighth century, you have Vaigran Brahmanas coming from places like Madhadesh. Now Madhadesh would be Doha, Ganga Yamuna Doha. Brahmanas start coming from places like Savasti. They come from Gauda. They come from Odhadesh. So the point is that these interactions are basically happening and this is what it is. And when these kinds of interactions are happening and these kinds of developments are, what you got taking place, what you will also notice is that there are records in stone. Now, everything is not a copper plate, there are records in stone also. For example, the simple inscription that you have of uh, the time of uh, Mahasiva Gupta Marajana, it's a stone record. And so there are several other half a dozen records of, in stone that you find. Now, what is the significance of the stone records? Stone records are public records. Copper plates are private records. You as a ruler would give me a, a copper plate which I'll keep and bring out only when there's a problem of contestation. But stone records are listed records which are there in the public domain and whosoever is a learned fellow can read that. And so what is happening is that gradually you find communication of ideas is taking place. And so communication of ideas is happening through Brahmanas, Brahmanic settlements, temple art, Buddhist monasteries, they're all culturally, what you call, intervening and communicating with people and trying to create a value system. And that it is happening can be seen from the fact that you see the poet, the artist, the engraver, that they are all expressing ideas and communicating a value system which seems to be similar, which suggests that epic Puranic ideas have circulated in these areas and that they have circulated and are circulating among people and in some senses, party royalty is involved in the act. Now that brings in the story of text and context. Now we understand that text is written either on stone or on copper plate or you know, paper or whatever. And you say context is that the material milli. Now the relationship between text and context we should realize is not a one way traffic. They're impacting each other. Because the text can transform the context, context can transform the text. This is something that we want to remember in developing areas such as Dakshina, Koshala, Vidharva, Malava, and so on and so forth. And this is something that we want to keep in mind. However, having said all of this, the point that one would like to make is that developments were not all homogeneous. Developments were not undifferentiated. The developments within the Khrana Koshara were patchy. Some areas developed, other areas developing, and some areas still undeveloped because things happen gradually over time. Similarly, all developments were not amicable, peaceful. There would be contestation by people trying to integrate different areas and cultures, but we don't have evidence to show that contestation was taking place. Evidence for contestations they start coming up only in the second millennium AD and after, not earlier. But that is something that limitations of the data that we have. Now, when I say this thing, finally, it leads me to my conclusion. In our four minutes time, I'll try to sum up the story. Now, when we're talking about these things, at this juncture, somebody might ask me that what is the distinction between a region and a sub-region? If you talk about Dakhira Koshal as a sub-region, why do you say so? And how does it separate itself from the idea of a region? Now, frankly speaking, defining a sub-region is as difficult as defining a region. But there are what you call um, certain issues that as students of history or as historians, we got to remember. Now, what is this? Now, when you're talking about a sub-region, you can neither generalize nor can you essentialize. Why I'm saying, if you generalize the subregion within a region, then the specificity of the subregion is lost. If you essentialize the subregion, then the general influences that come from the region as a whole, now they are forgotten. And therefore, neither can you generalize nor can you essentialize. And so then where do you go from there? When you look at it, you would find more closely that subregions have certain specificities. 
What are the specificities? That within the overall framework of the region, in the subregion, you would find that there are distinctiveness in areas such as the use of a language, the spoken language, for example, the cuisine, art forms, dance forms, and more importantly, even in marriage circuits. Even if you look today, that people in the Sambalpur area would prefer to marry the children in that area. People in Katakpuri belt would want to marry the children within that area. Only in extreme cases that you know, they will cut across these cultural zones. Similarly, when you're talking about cuisine, that the choice of food differs in each of these what you call historical cultural regions. When you're talking about tradition of weaving, that differs. And uh, art forms, dance forms, that distinctiveness. So then how do you look at the sub-region vis-a-vis a region? What you do is that a sub-region is into a region, yet out of it. A sub-region is into a region and yet out of it. When I say that, I'll give you one small example. All of us will all the time talk about Orifan temples. This is the that you have in Puri Kata belts and so on. But if you look at it closely, you will find that the Rekhadaola style is not just the making of the Puri Kataka belt. It's a combination of Kalinga, Dakshina Kosha, and the Katakuri or the Utkala style. The three have combined. And the combination was possible because first it is the Kalinga style, Utkala style, which combined. And in the Somavam says the move from Dakshina Koshala to Utkala, they carry the Dakshina Koshala style with them. And so there's a combination of these. Now, what is that this Somavam says carried? Now, if you look at the Dakshina Koshala temples, these are brick temples. They're built on star-shaped foundations. When I say star-shaped foundations, they're two, rack, they're two squares which are put diagonally at 45 degrees. So that creates the star shape. And therefore, on top of that, when you build a temple, it gives you scope to create those faces which are multiple. And so if you look at the Rikhadar of style, these faces that you have multiple faces where the design sculptures could be all integrated, but that is the Dakhana Koshala contribution. That kind of temples in Dakhana Koshala, you would see coming at Sirpur, at Rajim, at Burikomna, and that both area, this, um, what you call, the area of Koshaleshwar at Badyana is a meeting point of the coastal Odisha and South Koshala style. And therefore, when you say the creation of a regional style, Dakhana Koshala contributes to the creation of a, what you call, a Odisha style but yet retains the specificities, does not lose its identity. And so these aspects, they get sharpened later on under the Kalash, sort of Somovamsi and the Kalashuri. And if one is looking to, for a textual representation of Dakshina Koshwara identity, all of you might know, let me repeat or tarry, like Saradas creates in that, what you Uriya Mahabharata, an identity for Odra, Odra Desha. Similarly, you have the making of a Dakhana Koshal identity, most likely in Koshal and the Kavya. The Koshal and the Kavya, the 17th century text, it creates a Dakhana Koshal identity. And um, that is something um, that one can see. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, and you know, whatever questions you have, I'm willing to answer. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much, sir, for the informative lecture. Uh, now, I request uh, Dr. Sasmita Rani Sasani, the School of History, to moderate the question and session. Uh, I request uh, the moderator and uh, also uh, the head of the School of History to kindly confine to the to, to questions which are related to the topic that Sar spoke about. Thank you, sir. And uh, I thank uh, Professor uh, Piti Sahu, sir, for this uh, productive session which opens many areas of research and yes uh, regions are not uh, homogeneous entities uh, it is uh, a reproduction of multiplicity of uh, forces and there are identities within identities belongingnesses within belongingness and consciousness within consciousness and apart from this there are also the historical externalities and internalities
the you know state uh, the regional formation uh, now i will uh, you know take some of the questions uh, from the chat box as well as uh, from the audience also i think i need to uh, you know first address some of the questions uh, in the chat box and i am taking those questions which are uh, german uh, to the question talk only uh, there has been uh, one question from uh, somnita majumdar uh, the question is uh, the textual representation of a region appears to be idealized and strict mislead a historian to conceptualize a region homogeneously so how can uh, how the archaeological material can help along with the text will help in setting uh, this uh, regions and understanding this region so can you can you abridge that question instead of reading this whole paragraph uh, yeah, what is that what uh, uh, yeah the question is how can we use the archaeological material along with the text you know so that there may not be uh, a homogeneous understanding of the region because his question is basically the text are you know idealized the homogeneous right. identities of the region so in that situation how the archaeological material can help uh, in in uh, understanding this heterogeneous understanding of the region hmm. archaeology becomes understandable only if we are familiar with concepts with theory unless you know uh, what you call um, what a locality formation is unless you know what a secondary state formation is how will you organize your archaeological data similarly you see archaeological data will become amenable only if the student or the historian ask questions to it that okay you have these, these these artifacts but what do these artifacts represent do they represent north indian influence central indian influence do the different uh, represent social differentiation do they refer, uh, refer to hierarchy for example in any excavation it's only up to 3% that the deluxe ware will be found the rest of it is all common pottery which would suggest that only the well to do in society will use this or if you look into the burials most of the burials will have local material only a few burials might have non local objects and when the few burials have non local objects then the question would be why is it so that means they might represent some elite category so the question is that archaeological material will become amenable to understanding only if conceptually we are familiar with some theory some concepts otherwise you know you have a pottery you have coins you have beads everywhere and so what do you make out of it but then you have to contextualize those data you have to quantify that data then patterns will evolve Uh, uh, the uh, next question is also from the same uh, uh, audience. That is, how does it differ? How does it differ play a role in setting uh, the identity of a region? In, in setting the identity of a region, integrating oh, locality. Okay. See, tithas are important because if you look at the tithas, the tithas increasingly emerge as a meeting and melting spot. meeting and melting point and in the in the, the data that you have are essentially some manifestation of a vishnu or a shiva or a shakti and these are patronized both by royalty and local notables and so when local notables and royalty patronize them they are trying to appropriate it to enhance their own status and then the pilgrims who keep moving from tirtha to tirtha the tirthas don't stand alone tirthas are a part of a network so when tirthas they what to allow for networking people move from place to place and that also helps in cultural dissemination interaction between different points different nodes and therefore they create a larger cultural whole they create a value system which becomes more overarching and therefore tirthas are important agencies in the creation of 
what you would call a transregional culture. Uh, uh, now I uh, ask our audiences uh, if they have any uh, question they can directly ask uh, to Professor Vicky Sabata. Hello. Yeah, please. Uh, Professor, Hello. Professor Sahu. Yeah. Conceptually well related talk. Really enlightening. Thank you very much. Just a small query. Please, please, sir. Uh, can, can we look at a subregion from an ecological point of view? Is there, are there any examples of a subregion being specified? I mean, in any of the historical sources, a subregion being specified by some ecological wealth or ecological uh, uh, source. Hmm. That's one. Second is, you told a very interesting point about a tirtha being uh, used to appropriate uh, the local authority, or maybe of a king or uh, and then you have spoken about Tita being part of a network and the Hindu ideology, you also spoke about that. How does, in the trans-regional realm, the sub-region also fit into, in that kind of a network? Thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, you see, this small example that I can give you, uh, are two. One, the first point that you asked, that from ecological perspective, uh, 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 what you call, uh, in the case of uh, Orissa, all I can say is that there's a nice paper by a gentleman called G.C. Tripathi. Uh, there's a book which is called Centers Out There. Centers Out There, it's edited by Herman Kulke. And so in that book, the, the, the GC3 party has an article which deals with Keunjar. That how Keunjar, which we normally think to be a forested area, was evolving, and what is the ecology of that area, and because of that given ecology, what are that evolves in Keunjar, what the rulers had to do in that area, and how are they borrowing, competing, emulating, the Puri framework, now all that is very nicely captured. So if you can just have a look at that um, uh, Haman Kulke edited volume centers out there, and there this paper of the city party, that will answer this question of ecology quite well, one. Secondly, and this, uh, how is this, uh, what you call interaction between the uh, sub-region and the trans-regional happening? I will tell you another example. A good example is the story of Stambeshwari or Kambeshwari. The Kambeshwari is the Prakrit version, Stambeshwari is the Sanskrit version. Now, this is a deity which evolved in Central Orissa, in the, um, what you call um, this um, um, belt of um, um, both Bhulwani and Dhenkana. Now, that deity gradually, uh, what you call through um, a variety of historical processes, goes and climbs up, is worshipped with mantras of Durga, and ultimately assumes the character of Subhadra. And therefore, when he, she assumes the character of Subhadra, she becomes a part of the Jagannath Trinity. And when she becomes a part of the Jagannath Trinity, then this Jagannath Trinity gradually becomes a part of the pan-Indian Vaishnav, what do you call, um, pantheon. And become the pan, it's a part of the pantheon that would show something that I, I would like to express, uh, you know, um, in these terms. That this is essentially what is happening is in this development, a local deity from central uh, Odisha, who gradually rising to become Subhadra, being worshipped with the Durga mantras, uh, and then ultimately become a part of an actually trinity, which then is becoming a part of a Vaishnava pantheon, what it demonstrates is that the overlap between localization of the trans-regional and universalization of the local. The local 
that was there in central Odisha, that is being universalized because it becomes a part of the Vaishnava pantheon ultimately. What Vaishnavism does is integrates this local and therefore the local is being universalized. And so that gives you an idea as to how culturally it becomes possible for several things that we call puja, the mantras, the priests, the activities and services rendered at various temples in several instances are borrowed from the tribal world, but then they become a part of the Brahmanic world. Because the Brahmanic world and the tribal world, they're constantly interacting and therefore they're borrowing from each other. So what we call Brahmanism, bit by bit is also transforming itself. So in the process of what you call Brahmanizing the tribals, Brahmanism is also being tribalized. So, so, so that is what tells us how the sub-regional element and what you call trans-regional, they shape each other. Thank, thank you, Professor. Very, very interesting and very enlightening. Thank you. I have, uh, sir, I have received uh, two more questions in the chat box. Uh, one, uh, one is from uh, Dr. Charana. Uh, she has a question, normally what happens, uh, we idealize history, that we had a very glorious civilization, something like that. It followed after the, uh, the colonial rulers said it is white man's model. I mean, we need to say this. So in this whole setup, how to construct the history of subaltern? So it is uh, it, it diverting a little from present talk, but I think mm. it has a relevance since we also need to talk about uh, the role of the subalterns in setting up these regions, uh, uh, region and local. You see, frankly, the kind of history of and eulogizing of history or our past and so on and so forth is something which ended. Uh, say, in course of the 60s or so, by the mid 60s, that process was over. It's a question of, you know, who are our teachers? What is that our teachers have read? If our teachers have read things published up to 65 or 70, then we are finished. If our teachers are keeping abreast with what was published in 1920, into 2020, then he or she can then tell you what is what. And so in the last 50 years, if you see a whole lot of changes happen in history, the common man, the subalterns that you mentioned, different social categories, hierarchies of women, whether it is you know, the elite woman, whether it is the courtesan, whether it is the serving category, uh, um, uh, whether it is the nuns. And, and so, so you see, the point is you know, a range of work has been done. So it's a question of that who is our teacher, who is our supervisor, how well he or she is read, now, whether he or she is giving a reading list to me in, in, the, in the classroom or while they're discussing things which are things which were published in 2012 and 15 and 18 and 20 or 2005 or seven, or takes me back all the time to 1970. If once I is taking you back all the time to 1970, then you know, God save ourselves. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise, if somebody is bringing you into literature of the last 20, 25 years, then you know, you have an entirely different take, entirely different perspective on history and the history that we are reading is, you know, the, the history that you would wish to enjoy. Professor Gannaranjan. Uh, there is another question from Sankar. Ah, sir. Ji. Hello. Uh, please. Um, uh, uh, hello, sir. Uh, um, this is good afternoon. This is Jana from uh, Political Science. I just yeah. wanted to say uh, uh, thank you for such a wonderful presentation because I am a student of political science. And actually, uh, when we actually imagine about uh, these regions and uh, sub regional uh, politics, uh, sometimes we also ignore this, uh, you know, these historical facts. 
So this is just an, you know, uh, a small observation from my side because, uh, you know, I never thought that uh, uh, sub-regions could also be contextualized, uh, you know, uh, from the um, grounds that you have mentioned here. So uh, that's why I thought this is a very interesting lecture. Uh, so because, uh, uh, see, uh, when I look at the question of uh, regions and sub-regions, what actually appeals to me is, uh, you know, the kind of calculations, particularly if you look at the rational choice perspective, I mean, why people think about, I mean, the leaders who take up the initiative of, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, thinking about or cre creating a sense of imagination among the people about sub-regions, how, what kind of calculations do they have in their mind? So I think, so from that context, uh, and also um, the question of underdevelopment, the question of, but I think what was unique in your lecture was, uh, I mean, uh, how you historicized uh, the whole context. I think that was, uh, I mean, interesting. Thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 there is another question from Sankar. Uh, uh, can you please throw some light on the emergence of social stratification uh, after the interaction uh, between the tribal society and new dominical uh, order that was it. The social stratification that emerged after the interaction between the tribal society and the dominical order which was gradually penetrating into this place. You see, the point that I was making is that uh, from around the 6th century and after, you start getting references in the, uh, what you call land grant charters or inscriptions of different social categories. Now, these are categories that you get in Kutumbin. Now, Kutumbin uh, is a category which you find in several parts of North India, including Chhattisgarh and the Kosher. Now, it's a middle peasant category. Then, as you move on, uh, into the time of the Pandavamsis, then you start getting references to, as I was telling, your Nivasin and Pradhana Nivasin, a Prativasin and Pradhan Prativasin. Now, Prativasin would basically mean in local inhabitant. When you say Pradhana Prativasin, it would be local notable, a man who has more land, economy well to do, socially respected, and so on. Now, when you have these things happening simultaneously, you get reference to a whole lot of professional categories. And these are, as I was mentioning, the Kayastha. And interestingly, in Koshlo Odisha, you have the Karana, here you have the Kayastha. Here you have terms like Vanika. And in Koshlo Odisha, you have terms like Shreshti. The distinction is Shreshti is a rich trader. Vanika is a small petty trader. You have references to Swarnakara, gold maker, Sutradhara, who is an art architect, Rupakara, who, what you call, paints or sculpts, sculptures. Shilpi is a, um, what do you call, somebody who, um, what do you call, chisels. Uh, you have references to the Marakara, the garden maker, or the flower, or horticulture fellow. You have references to the gold the um, cowherd, and uh, you have the Kaladhashin. The Kaladhashin is somebody who is an astrologer, and, 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 and so on. So these categories which come up, when they come up, they don't just hang there or live, what you call, side by side. Ultimately, they get higher kinds in a, what you call, caste system. They get higher kinds in a caste system because a caste system is essentially based on ideas like endogamy and commensality. So to reduce it more to common language, roti and beti. That is, jo hamare barabar hai, uske saath utsen batke khayenge. Shadi vivaha, hamare jo barabar hai, usi parivar mein karayenge. And so that is, you know, your endogamy and commensality. How will this happen? It will happen because that obviously the Malakara or somebody Shirpin will not be earning as much as a Suvarnakara or as a Kayastha 
or as um, what you call evanical, they will be earning much more. So they can sustain better rituals and more expensive rituals. And then so then they, they do the, the higher rituals. You and me as poorer people will not be able to sustain them. We do lower rituals. Then automatically, culturally, a differentiation emerges. And therefore, ultimately, we will arrange ourselves in a caste order with reference to the Varna scheme of things. This Varna scheme of things is a pan-Indian scheme. And Varna scheme is hierarchical. Brahmana Musa Nikala, Shudra Persa Nikala, Vaishya um, Thaise, and Khatriya Amse. And therefore, it's as it is hierarchical. And therefore, depending on our social religious status, economic well being, you would be high Kais. That the Monika, the Kayasta, the Swarnakara, they will replace up the ladder, and others will replace down the ladder. And these things are happening gradually. They don't start off happening from the middle of the first century, first millennium itself. The occupations and things come, come up, and then it's only towards the end of the first millennium, the beginning of the second millennium, that caste orders just start happening. This is nothing typical about Dakhna Koshara. This is happening in Koshara. This is happening in Kerala. This is happening in Bengal. Because the caste orders, they crystallize, they consolidate only in the early part of the second millennium. So regional caste societies come up all over this country only in the early part of the second millennium. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for answering all the questions beautifully and with appropriate examples. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sasani, thank you. Thank you so much for moderating well. Uh, now I request Dr. Santosh Kumar Malik uh, from the School of History uh, for a follow-up for more word of things. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, a very good uh, afternoon, all of you. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor N. Nagarajus, sir. Honorable Speaker, Professor Vairi Prasad Chaushya and other distinguished participants. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks. I, on behalf of the School of History, Gangadhar Mary University, Sambalpur, extended a very heartly vote of thanks to the Honorable Speaker, Professor Bhairav Prasad Sahasar, for speaking on the issues of the region and sub-region, that the shaping of the Khina Kausala. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation. I wholly I wholeheartedly express our thanks to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor S. Nagaraju, sir, PGC Professor Mohin Mohammad, sir, Registrar, Srimati Jugali Shuri Dasa, Madam, Deputy Registrar, Dr. Umar Chandrapati, sir, and all the participants. We invite you all for the next lecture by Professor Vishnu Mahapatra, sir, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar, thank Namaskar. You, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank Dr. Malik. Uh, now I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for a permanent. Uh, uh, I so, think uh, the GM University profusely thanks Professor Sahu for such a wonderful lecture, and the program comes to an end. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.